They say that life changes after a certain age, that at some point the fire in your heart dies down and you're left with a faintly flickering embers. You settle into the rhythm of loneliness, believing that the most exciting parts of your life are behind you. So I thought. My name is Martha Harris and I am 65 years old. I've spent the last five years as a widow, living in a large, aging mansion that feels as empty as my heart has felt for years. There's a kind of peace in the silence, but also a loneliness that wraps around you like a heavy cloak, pulling you deeper into the silence. But all that changed when Samuel came into my life. He was 25, young, passionate, and full of life in a way that reminded me of a version of myself I had long forgotten. I never intended to fall in love with him. In fact, I never thought I could still feel what I ended up feeling. This isn't a story about youthful passion, nor is it about love in the traditional sense. It's about the unexpected, the disruptive force of desire that shows up when you think you're beyond it. I can't explain why it happened, or even if it should have, but I know this. Samuel made me feel alive again in a way I never thought possible. My property, on the outskirts of a small coastal town, has been derelict for years. It is a house built on memories, Memories of my husband Charles, who died five years ago, and of the life we once shared. The walls echo with the sound of the past, a past I cling to because it's all I've had for so long. Since Charles's death, my life has been defined by routine. I wake up early, brew coffee, and sit by the window watching the ocean go in and out, as if waiting for something to change. But nothing ever does. I have tried to keep busy, I volunteered at the library and even took up knitting at one point, but none of it filled the void. My career as a journalist was long over by the time Charles died, and now I felt like a relic, useless, forgotten. The woman who had once traveled the world, interviewing dignitaries and exploring foreign lands, had been reduced to someone who rarely left her house. Even my body betrayed me. The pain in my joints was a daily reminder of how far I'd fallen from my prime. I still see people from time to time. Alice, my neighbor and closest friend, would come for tea on Sundays, but even these visits felt hollow. She had her own life, her own family, and I couldn't help but feel like an outsider looking in. It was as if I had become a ghost in my own life, drifting through the days with no clear purpose. The house, once vibrant and full of life, was also beginning to show its age. The roof was leaking, the foundation was creaking, and the wood around the windows had begun to rot. It was a fitting metaphor for how I felt inside, weathered and crumbling, but too tired to do anything about it. Until the day when the cracks in the walls of the old estate became too big to ignore. The house needed repair, and so did I, although I didn't realize it at the time. I remember the first day Samuel came to the house as clearly as if it were yesterday. It was a warm day in late spring, and I had called a local contractor to assess the damage. When the truck pulled up, I expected to see some grizzled old builder. Instead, Samuel stepped out, young, strong, and full of energy. He was wearing a faded t-shirt and jeans, his hair disheveled by the wind, and his smile was easy, as if the world hadn't yet weighed on him. I immediately felt uncomfortable in his presence, not because of anything he did, but because I wasn't used to being around someone so young. He introduced himself with a confidence that both surprised and intrigued me. Mrs. Harris, I'm Samuel. I'll be working on the house for the next few weeks. I shook his hand, my fingers brushing the calluses on his palm. It felt solid, grounded, and it made me aware of how fragile I had become. At that moment, I wasn't thinking about anything else but the fact that he was going to fix the house, but something inside me shifted. As the days passed, Samuel worked diligently, and I often found myself hanging around the building sites. At first it was out of curiosity, I had nothing better to do, but I soon realized that I was drawn to his presence, to the vitality he exuded. His laughter filled the quiet house, and his music, he sometimes played guitar during breaks, floated through the halls like a forgotten melody. We often talked during his breaks. He asked me about my life, my travels as a journalist, 
and I found myself opening up to him in a way I hadn't with anyone for years. He was fascinated by my stories, genuinely interested in what I had to say. It was the first time in a long time that I felt truly seen. Samuel told me about his own life, how he worked in construction to save up for music school, how he wanted to be a professional guitarist. There was a fire in him, a hunger for life that I had once had, but lost somewhere along the way. And as I listened to him talk about his dreams, I felt something stir inside me. I should have known then that I was playing with fire, but I told myself it was harmless. After all, I was a widow, old enough to be his mother. What could happen? Days turned into weeks, and Samuel's presence in the house became something I looked forward to more than I cared to admit. I began to notice little things, the way his muscles flexed when he lifted heavy beams, the way his eyes sparkled when he smiled, and the way he seemed to linger a little longer than necessary when we talked. The first real spark of desire came one afternoon when I brought him a glass of water. It was a hot day and the sun was beating down mercilessly. I watched as Samuel downed the glass in one long gulp, sweat dripping down his neck. As he handed the glass back to me, his fingers brushed over mine. It was such a small, innocent touch, but it sent a shock through me that I wasn't prepared for. That night, as I lay in bed, I couldn't stop thinking about it, about him. My mind went to places it hadn't gone in years. I imagined what it would feel like to be touched again, to be held, but then guilt crept in. How could I think such things about someone so much younger? It was absurd, shameful, but the thoughts didn't go away. Every time I saw him, they got stronger. I began to notice myself lingering in front of the mirror before he arrived, adjusting my clothes, making sure my hair was neat. It was silly, but I couldn't help it. One afternoon, as we walked around the estate, I tripped over an uneven stone and stumbled into him. His hands caught me before I could fall and steadied me. We stood there for a moment, too close, his hands gripping my arms. My breath caught in my throat and I could feel the heat radiating from his body. I've got you, he said softly, his voice low. I looked up at him and at that moment something passed between us. It was brief, just a glimmer of recognition, but it was enough. I pulled away quickly, muttering my thanks, but the damage was done. Something had shifted and there was no turning back. The first kiss was late one night. Samuel had stayed behind after work to help me move some furniture into the attic. We were both tired. The light in the attic was dim and the air was thick with dust. When we were finished, we sat down on an old bench to catch our breath. We talked for a while, the conversation flowing easily, as it always did. But then something changed. The silence between us grew longer, the air heavy with unspoken words. I could feel him watching me, his gaze lingering on my face, and when I looked up, our eyes locked. I don't know who moved first. All I remember is the sensation of his lips against mine, gentle, hesitant, but full of intent. I should have pulled away, should have stopped it right then and there, but I didn't. Instead, I kissed him back, letting myself get lost in the moment. When we finally pulled apart, I could see the uncertainty in his eyes. Martha, I don't, I whispered, placing a hand on his chest. Just don't. Don't. We didn't speak of it after that, but the kiss lingered in the air between us, a secret we both carried. I was filled with a mix of exhilaration and shame. The guilt gnawed at me, but the desire was stronger. I felt alive again in ways I hadn't in years. Over the next few weeks, our encounters became more frequent. We never spoke about what was happening between us, but the physical tension was undeniable. When we were alone, he would kiss me, his touch growing bolder with each passing day. We would find secluded corners of the house to steal moments together, his hands exploring my body with a tenderness that made me forget everything else. But it wasn't just physical. Samuel had awakened something deeper in me, a yearning for connection, for passion, for life. He made me feel like a woman again, not just a widow stuck in the past. 
I found myself looking forward to his touch, to the way he made me feel desired. Yet with every stolen moment, the guilt grew. I thought of Charles often, of the life we had built together, and I wondered what he would think if he knew. But I couldn't stop. I didn't want to stop. The affair with Samuel was intoxicating, but it came at a price. The guilt I felt about Charles was only part of it. There was also the fear of being discovered, the knowledge that what I was doing was dangerous, not just for me, but for Samuel, too. Alice, my neighbor, began to notice the changes in me. One afternoon, over tea, she mentioned how alive I seemed lately, how there was a new energy about me. She was curious, of course, and I could see the questions forming in her mind. I brushed them off, telling her that I had just been concentrating on the house and enjoying the renovations. But I could see the doubt in her eyes. She didn't know, of course, but she suspected something, and that suspicion made me paranoid. I began to be more careful around Samuel, making sure we were never seen together outside the house. But it wasn't just Alice. The guilt weighed on me in ways I hadn't expected. Samuel, on the other hand, seemed to be falling deeper into the affair. He stayed longer after work, wanted to spend more time with me, to talk, to touch. He was young, full of passion, and I could tell he was beginning to expect more from me than I was prepared to give. One evening, after a particularly intense moment between us, he asked me if I could ever see a future with him. The question took me by surprise, and I didn't know how to answer it. A future? It was an absurd thought. I was 65, and he was 25. What future could we have? But the look in his eyes told me he meant it. He wanted something more from me, something I wasn't sure I could give. After Samuel's question, things became tense between us. I could feel the weight of his expectations pressing down on me, and it frightened me. I had never intended the affair to be more than a fleeting moment of passion, a way of feeling alive again. But Samuel wanted more, and I didn't know how to give it to him. I tried to distance myself. I started avoiding him when he came to the house, making excuses for why I couldn't spend time with him. But it was harder than I thought it would be. Every time I saw him, the desire would come back, and I couldn't help but be drawn to him. It was a constant push and pull. Wanting him, but knowing I couldn't have him. Needing him, but knowing it would never last. I was living a double life, caught between the woman I had been for so many years and the woman I had become with Samuel. One day, Alice came over unexpectedly while Samuel was in the house. I had to scramble to keep her from seeing him, and the fear of being caught made my heart race. It was close, too close, and it made me realize how dangerous the situation had become. The breaking point came after weeks of tension. Samuel had become frustrated with my distance, and one evening, after another round of excuses from me, he confronted me. He wanted to know what we were doing, what I wanted from him. He was falling in love with me, he said, and he needed to know if I felt the same. His words hit me like a punch in the gut. Love? How could I love him? I cared for him, yes, but love? That was impossible. I couldn't give him what he wanted, and the realization crushed me. I tried to explain to him, tried to make him understand that I was too old, too broken for him, but he wouldn't listen. He didn't care about my age, he said. He didn't care about any of that. He just wanted me, but I knew it couldn't last. The guilt, the shame, the fear, it was all too much. So with a heavy heart, I told him we had to end it. There was no future for us, and the sooner we accepted that, the better. Samuel was devastated. He begged me to reconsider, but I was firm. It was over, it had to be. After Samuel left, I was consumed by a deep sense of loss. The house felt emptier than ever, and the silence was deafening. I had let go of the one thing that had made me feel alive again, and now I was left with nothing but memories. I spent the next few months thinking about my life, my choices, and the affair with Samuel. I thought about Charles, the life we had built together, and the love we had shared. It was a different kind of love to the one I had felt with Samuel. Deeper, more stable, but it was love nonetheless, 